Um, I wanted to introduce Sue Ann Bell, and I wanted to start by saying I met Sue Ann in her office almost a decade ago. I don't know if she remembers this. I was a CCL advocate just starting to understand how health was, you know, climate and health came together. And Sue Ann was like ahead of the curve, starting to introduce it in terms of education and the nursing curriculum. And so I called her up and asked if I could come by. And she says to me, have you seen the CDC wheel? And I'm like, no, what's a CDC wheel? Well, I noticed it's in your PowerPoint. It's in every single PowerPoint I've used since then. And um, it's just this great organizing uh, tool that I'm very, very grateful to her for. So she is an assistant professor at the University of Michigan School of Nursing, uh, where her research is supported by the NIH. And it focuses on health and well-being of aging populations in the context of disasters and public health emergencies. She's currently serving on FEMA's National Advisory Board, as well as the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services National Council on Seniors and Disasters. She's clinically active in uh, disaster response through the HHS again. And um, she's overseen some of the recent, or the HHS, I'm not sure, is that the HHS has overseen recent deployments on COVID-19, uh, Hurricane Maria, and 2018 Paradise, um, California wildfires, or did you personally oversee those? So, I I responded as a clinician with HHS, and you'll see some pictures in a, in a minute, so I can talk more about that. Great. So, Sue Ann, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to let you start. I think Sue Ann is uh, open to discussion questions as you go through, but I'll let her talk. Great. I'm going to get my screen going here. Um, I'm actually, I said earlier, I'm unhappy with my, my Zoom background. I'm actually at a um, meeting of our Health Policy Institute at, at UM right now. Um, and right as I I stepped out to give this talk and right as I was leaving, there was a, a big discussion. Um, it's the National Advisory Board meeting of our Health Policy Institute. And there was a discussion about decarbonizing UM and um, other climate change initiatives that Michigan Medicine can, can take the lead on. And um, I was like, well, this is a perfect time for me as that discussion was concluding to step out. Um, so I was happy to hear that because it's not something that we hear enough uh, at UM. But thank you for having me today. I would be super happy for any discussion or um, you know, feel free to interrupt me or um, raise your hand or anything during, during this presentation. Um, I'd much rather have an interactive discussion than, than me talking. Um, I appreciate the, the introduction, Lisa, and um, can't believe it's been 10 years that um, you've been such a big supporter of me and I'm, I'm super grateful and grateful for the invitation today to talk. So disclosures from me, um, uh, the NIH uh, supports my work in this uh, grant listed here and others. It's one of the few um, climate change and health proposals that the NIH is, has funded. Um, although hopefully we we're starting to see some change there um, going forward now and in the future. I will talk today about um, my small contribution to addressing climate change um, and that I study climate change through aging, disasters, and pandemics, and through my work as a, as a clinician and as a scientist. And that's the first two parts of, my, of this talk today. And then the third talk is about some of the um, urging, urgent uh, policy and scientific needs around um, uh, disaster management for older adults. But as Lisa said, um, my uh, initial training was as a nurse practitioner, and I'm active with the National Disaster Medical System through the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So when there is a disaster that requires federal involvement or like exceeds exceeds the capacity of states and localities, then um, I'm on a team that responds to that. And um, you see the picture on the left, the blue arrow is my head of me going to um, Hurricane Irma. Um, and then this picture on the right is during the pandemic going to, um, we worked with the Maryland National Guard to do voluntary um, assessments and PPE training in nursing homes throughout Maryland. And we're, 
I'm dressed like a space bunny because, um, you know, at the time there were no visitor policies in nursing homes because this was, you know, at the court, sort of at the height of the newness of the pandemic. And so our concerns about transmitting um, COVID to you know, vulnerable nursing home residents was really high. I also spent six weeks in Hurricane Maria um, and um, I ran a kind of a fast track tent um, on the, the dock of the cruise ship terminal where we supported the Navy ship, the Comfort um, that you can see in the background on the bottom picture. And um, last response picture, um, a bit of a, you know, what felt like a, a good thing is I helped to set up and support the first FEMA mass uh, vaccination center in um, Oakland, California. And if you see, I don't know if you can see my, I can't, this, if you can see my cursor, um, this middle tent, um, I was the, the tent boss of, um, you know, of um, cars that would drive through and we had um, US Forestry Service EMTs that were giving COVID vaccinations. Um, and we ended up uh, at the height of the operation, we're doing around 7,000 vaccinations a day. Um, so definitely a rewarding part of, of, the, of the response work that I do. But here's the, the, famous, the famous wheel that probably most of you have seen by now, but I usually include this in a talk because you know when I think of climate change and health, I really do try to think of you know, what are the small steps or the small contribution that I can make rather than being overwhelmed by, you know, kind of the totality of it. So my work focuses on the impact of climate change in terms of severe weather um, or extreme weather events. Um, and I think predominantly about my work in aging, but also in addressing uh, chronic health conditions. A new wheel, maybe maybe you haven't seen this before, um, but this is the World Health Organization's framework for building climate resilient health systems. Um, and again, how I organize some of my thinking um, is the circles on the, the, the two black circles, um, health and climate research, which is my main main day-to-day -day job um, where I study emergency preparedness and um, disaster management, and then also provide clinical care in, in both those spaces. So we know disasters are um, huge. They're having huge impacts across, um, across the US and especially globally. Um, this is some tracking that's been done since 1980. Um, that um, shows the impacts of disasters just by trying to quantify some of these, um, some of the financial impacts of, of disasters or the economic impacts. Um, so $285 billion disasters have occurred in the U.S. since 1980. Um, and if um, the bottom right shows Texas itself is, um, you know, a state that has, you know, severe impacts, $124 billion disasters, the most of any state. Um, all 50 states have had at least $1 billion disaster. And if I'm, I could probably be fact checked on this, but I'm not sure that this includes territories. Um, I think the next slide might, might clarify that for me. But 2021 alone, um, there were 20 separate billion dollar weather climate disasters. Um, so just, we're seeing more um, and more huge impacts that um, you know are affecting health and affecting well-being. And one of the best ways we can quantify that is at least by showing some infographics or statistics to uh, people about this is what it's costing us. But one interesting aspect of this um, million billion dollar disaster um, kind of tracking work is that that um, I actually asked the, the person doing this work or leading this work if I could use these slides in, in talks. And, the, and I when we were emailing back and forth, I asked about um, health and healthcare. And he specifically said, we don't have a good way of understanding that. Um, and so that's the impacts on, on, the economic impacts on health um, are not included in this. So I think that's a really like kind of takeaway thing if we think about this is billion dollar uh, 
billion dollar disasters in terms of infrastructure and recovery, but not in terms of the health impacts on, on individual populations. I always like to lay out there what is a disaster. And this comes from the, oh, I, I see a question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with it. Do you wanna go ahead? Yeah. Elizabeth? Um, given, given the fact that uh, there's very little data from the, the federal entities that are involved with climate change, do you know of any fellowship programs or residency programs that deal specifically in medicine with the impacts of health and uh, climate change? You know, I keep hearing about more and more, uh, you know, opportunities, um, climate and health specifically. There, there are certificate programs out there. Um, I know of people that have done them. I probably would have to email you offline about that um, with, with some names, but they, they do exist. And they're in the form of certificate programs usually um, rather than fellowships or, um, or um, you know, I guess ways to that you you can be paid rather than 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 pay um, in terms of tuition. Um, I do maybe, know University of Colorado just started one in Boulder. Um, you pay, like Sue Ann was saying, to to do it, and then Yale has one that also uh, requires a tuition that I know of, and I'm sure there's more. And the consortium's claim, uh, climate and equity fellowship is also just the link to that was just put in. Yeah, but I believe that we'll see more opportunities coming, um, especially as the current administration has made it uh, more more of a focus. There's I'm going to get off topic for a minute, but you know, for me in my work, I'm a researcher, so I need to have grant funding to do my work, and um, so that's something I follow carefully. The National Institute of Health announced a $100 million climate and health initiative um, about, it's probably been about a year ago since they've announced that and now have a number of funding opportunities. Um, and some of those funding opportunities will include, certainly will be research focused, but also include postdoctoral training and um, you know other sorts of research training opportunities. Any, any other questions? I have a question break built in in a little bit, but I'll launch back if I don't see hands. So um, I always like to, to formally define disaster. Um, um, and you can see that on the screen from the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent, but there, it, um, in red, you can see, um, a uh, vulnerability plus a hazard when those are combined that equals a disaster and um oops let me see i think i got off here we go so laying that out again because i'm going to come back to this for some further discussion but if you if we're thinking about the vulnerability of a community or a population combined with a hazard um, and that exceeds their capacity that's a disaster um we have to think that disasters aren't natural. Um, and I think when we characterize, you know, say the word natural disaster or characterize disasters are natural, then we imply that, um, that um, you know, whoops, it just happened. And, you know, communities were destroyed and there's nothing we, we can really do about it. When actually that's really not the case. Hazards like, um, you know, hurricanes or tornadoes or flooding are going to continue to occur, although we expect those to be increasing in frequency and severity, but it's the impact they have on populations um, that really does make it a disaster. And the, these two pictures, the picture on the left shows the Amazon River Basin, which has seasonal flooding with um, um, areas of New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, which were, were built in naturally low-lying areas um, that suffered hugely um, because of the impact of Katrina. Um, Hurricane Fiona um, hit Puerto Rico, I think two or, two or three months ago now. Um, and again, um, this is a this is a US territory that's still recovering. It, it was almost five years to the day from Hurricane Maria um, that Hurricane Fiona hit. Um, but Puerto Rico still uh, is 
struggling in recovery. Um, I'll talk later about, you know, the difference between response and recovery, but for many um, communities, recovery takes years to decades, and that's certainly the case for Puerto Rico. Um, I, I really want to emphasize the, the, the a key point of what I think about and what my work is about how a disaster affects infrastructure and um, how that infrastructure um, can be made more resilient to better support populations. So we saw after Hurricane Fiona, 100% um, of Puerto Rico was without power due to um, power grid failure. Um, just the entire territory had no power. And I tried to find some clear uh, statistics about how long the power outage lasted at the 100% level. Um, and um, I think it was around three days, but I couldn't really confirm that. And then up to three weeks, many communities were still without power. This is from um, a website called poweroutages.us, um, where you can track real-time power outages across the US. Um, um, power failure, public safety power shutoffs are all things I'm really interested in um, and how they affect um, um, communities and definitely vulnerable older adults. So a website that I follow a lot. Um, so in thinking about Puerto Rico is a hundred was, you know, without power, even weeks after, um, we know that, um, let's see, we know that, um, households are facing like new and kind of unprecedented challenges in paying their energy bills at the same time that, um, um, you know, changes in corporation management of power grids is happening. Um, and so I think you see this um, middle article was published June, 2021. Um, and then June, 2022, we see that um, Puerto Rico's electricity rates doubled just in, just in two years. Um, so amid um, questions of staffing readiness and maybe, um, economic inequalities, um, uh, you know, there's future challenges there um, in terms of thinking about equity in not just how we think about climate and health, but how we think about um, the distribution of resources. I'm gonna check the, check the chat for a minute. Okay, no questions. Um, but um, we know, I think I, that um, disasters are not natural. As I've just said, and we saw that so much in the in the pandemic as well. This is an older slide now, but the beginning of the pandemic, when we're talking about who gets what resources, are healthcare providers um, who are working on the front lines in in a public health emergency. It's a picture from the New York Post of using um, garbage bags as PPE because of. Um, shortages and failures in our strategic national, the management of the strategic national stockpile, which I'd be happy to talk about, um, but formerly managed by the CDC and around uh, at the time of the pandemic was the, the management of it switched to the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response, which is part of the US Department of Health and Human Services. So some, some massive failures there. Um, if we're thinking both about, um, historic inequalities of um, distribution of resources, but also um, that disasters and pandemic impacts are not natural um, or are not naturally occurring. But we also know very well now that disasters disproportionately affect structurally marginalized groups and communities. And this is a picture of a nurse named Mary Jo D'Amico um, who was a nurse at uh, Memorial Hospital after Hurricane Katrina. Um, she was one of the nurses who stayed taking care of um, the last group of patients to be evacuated after uh, Hurricane Katrina. And um, I've used this slide for years now. So now there's an Apple TV show about five days at Memorial. I don't know if anybody has seen it or heard it, but um, I haven't watched it, but I have read the book and definitely a great book to read or think about when you're thinking about uh, if you have an interest in ethics around disasters and again, um, scarce resource allocation. But, you know, as we know, you know, the way we deliver care may be inequitable. Also, the way that we support individuals and communities after disasters um, is inequitable as well. 
Um, I'm going to show three slides from a research study that I've admired uh, for a while, came out in 2019. Um, this uh, describes economic inequality and shows the change in net worth um, for different groups after, as a result of, um, of disasters. And if you follow this, um, you can see that um, for white homeowners who are college educated, they uh, actually had an increase in net worth after a disaster. Renters, white college educated renters as well, um, uh, not quite the same for um, those who had lower levels of education, also a, a, a marker of inequality. Um, but if we look at some of these same, same um, charts in, among um, homeowners who um, reported being black, um, you can see that the, that gain was so much smaller among college educated uh, black homeowners. And then if we look at across the board, um, black renters, whether they were college educated in high school or had a low, uh, eighth grade education also saw a decrease in their net worth. And if we look at um, Latinx, Latino communities, we see again, some of that sa those same challenges in, in terms of net worth after disasters. So I am going to talk for the, uh, a bit more about aging, but I wanted to go back to um, the definition of, dis of a disaster and introduce some challenges specific to older adults um, around you know, what some of these vulnerabilities are. So we, we know older adults have, 80% um, of older adults have one or more chronic health conditions. Um, social isolation is a challenge for older adults getting information um, and communicating with neighbors, um, family, uh, loved ones around disasters. Dementia, memory loss, and other forms of cognitive impairment are a challenge, as is frailty and mobility um, in terms of thinking about evacuating or taking um, you know, quick response in a disaster. And um, uh, fixed income, as well, or challenges with, with economics and socioeconomics. I'm gonna take a pause to see if anybody had any questions at this point. I see something in the chat. Hey, I'm gonna go on and tell you a little bit about my research. Um, so, um, I'm trained as a health services researcher, and this is like, this is an infographic of what I do every day. Um, Dr. Junk? Um, a question or two. Thank you. Sure. for inviting. So regarding Puerto Rico, it strikes me that um, if they get their power back up within five years, they're probably going to have another hurricane and it'll all be threatened again. If the power sources are distributed with sustainable sources, um, they're less, much less dependent on long distance transmission electricity. Has there been any discussion of getting uh, Puerto, Rico to, Puerto Rico to be a model state or territory with most of its energy from solar plus or minus other local sustainable sources? Um, I wish I had a better answer for you on that because it's a fabulous question. Um, it's not directly in the line of my study. So um, I can tell you Anecdotally, um, I um, interact with a number of emergency response leaders in Puerto Rico who have told me that they've made their individual switch to solar for this exact reason. Um, but maybe Lisa, you had something? No, I see your hand up. Sure. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, sure. Um, Larry's, Larry's question made me think of something, but Larry, sure. I think has one more question. Sure. I'd All love right. to find that answer though. Um, because All right, it's, I'll go, it's a good question. I'll go ahead with another one, which might tie in with future content in your talk. If so, just hold off with it. Sure. Uh, something that interests me and concerns me is sort of the late after effects of disasters that cause people to be displaced from their home, where uh, beyond the immediate effects of the, uh, uh, let's say, extreme weather event itself, people have health consequences, their health care is delayed, they're off their medications. This can be a very sudden and urgent problem in people with diabetes, uh, epilepsy, 
uh, perhaps heart disease and others. And uh, sometimes, uh, especially in other parts of the world, this displacement from homes can go on for weeks and months. Um, is there much attention being paid to that? You know, that is a, a primary focus of my work. So like when I introduce myself, usually I say that I study the long-term health impacts of disasters. Um, and so, uh, you know, I try to understand how are people being affected by disasters, not just in terms of thinking about injuries and immediate illness, but what's happening longer down the line. And I do have a slide about some research that I've done um, that I'll, I will touch on. Um, so I think that's a really important question that, um, you know, we operate so much in this sort of like immediate reactive standpoint that there's not enough, even scientific understanding of how disasters impact people in the longer term, and far less so in terms of thinking about people who migrate um, because of disasters or people who, you know, evacuate on a short term. Um, Lisa, and then Elizabeth. Yeah, I, I was curious, and I, I remember after Hurricane Maria, we had that, you know, kind of prolonged uh, period of time where there was an IV shortage, or, or the fluids, I believe, were not, saline was not as available, and I think they said it was because, you know, four of the major medical supply stations are in Puerto Rico. Has that been addressed at all, do you know? You know, I used to, this same talk, I used to have a slide about in there, and I took it out a while ago, and so I um, I don't have a good answer for that either. So awesome questions for me. Um, I would love to be able to to answer that. Um, so maybe I could follow up with you on that. Uh, That's fine. I just think it's such a great example of health impacts at a you know a climate impact at a distance that affects health everywhere. Right. Right. Um, Elizabeth. So two points, one for Lisa, not only uh, the IV shortage, but in general, what we saw post COVID with uh, uh, lack of supplies in anywhere, we have to shorten our supply routes. We have to start doing more things in, uh, in regional areas to, make, to keep sustainability going, food resources, especially. Uh, given what happened uh, post COVID with uh, supply chain problems. My second point is, this is for Larry. There was a community down in Florida that uh, lost absolutely no power whatsoever. They have a huge green energy uh, support system with lots of solar and uh, uh, supplemented with wind. It's a perfect example of um, how to build in uh, infrastructure to directly address the impacts of climate change and would be really worth looking into for places like Puerto Rico that have been struggling. First of all, I think they got to kick Luma out of there. They totally bankrupted that country and has done nothing to uh, make the energy supply system more sustainable. But anyway, it's an excellent community to look at as a, as a way to regionalize and um, have small pockets of areas where power can be sustained. Uh, and then they can tie into each other as well to broaden the built-in uh, sustainability of the electrical grid. Great point. If you do see that, maybe you could drop drop that in the chat. I can't remember the name of that community, but I I, I did read about it. Um, Amy. Are you there? Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Sure, yeah, sure. this is easy. Um, going back to the slide about the billion dollar disasters, you said there were 20 in 2021. Um, I, I, how many were there years prior to that to, for comparison? I missed that. Um, you know, if you go to, I, there were 285 since 1980 and 124 in Texas. But that, um, if you go to billiondollardisasters.noaa.gov, I think it is, there's, there's a wealth of different information. And you can also look at that by, by drought, by heat wave, by flood. Okay. I was just looking for something like, do we have data on like 1980 compared to 2021, you know? 
I, yeah. we do. I mean, that okay. it, it is on that site. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And anybody else? Okay. So uh, this slide is about how I organize my research. And then I'm, um, I'm a researcher. So I am going to talk next about theory um, and um, how I use theory to guide my work as well. But my the overall goal of my work, I'm trained as a health services researcher, so I think about how to make um, healthcare systems um, safer and have better quality for um, diverse populations, but specifically for older adults, um, and also within that, how to make communities safer um, so that we can, older adults can stay in their preferred living environment as long as possible. I use different sources of, of large data. Prim primarily, I use um, Medicare data, um, which is one of the largest um, sources of um, insurance claims data out there, and I try to look at um, uh, Medicare data from disaster affected uh, areas to learn about um, how disasters are affecting older adults. Um, it's, it's inexact and imprecise science, but it is the one of the best sources of data that we have. I also do a lot of qualitative research. So talk to um, usually disaster affected healthcare providers. And I, I have looked a lot at um, home health and home-based care. So um, I um, think about the disaster management cycle of mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. And I overlay that with the social ecological model, um, which centers the individual, or for me, that's the older adult, and, and um, uses that to think about how different levels of, um, inter of interaction can help support that, that individual within the disaster management cycle. So how are we making um, um, choices at the policy or the society level that we can better support our older adult populations and what are some of those research needs um, that we can think about at, you know, in terms of, you know, how, what is policy around disaster response for older adults or um, how is the individual affected in terms of mitigation activities of a community. So I am going to talk a little bit about each of these levels. Um, so I'll start with the individual level. Um, this was a research study that I did a couple years ago that um, we used a large source of data called the Health and Retirement Study, um, which is this, um, you know, years, decades long running study of um, older adults. Um, and we wanted to know if you lived through a disaster, what happened to your health um, um, in terms of your ability to your your healthy behaviors that would help you know help you keep living a, a healthy life? Um, and so we compared around twenty thousand individuals who were interviewed multiple times um, over the course of the study, and we compared those to compared who had experienced a disaster to who did not. And we found that if you lived through a disaster, um, there are certain types of important health behaviors for aging that um, were affected by living through a disaster, um, particularly around physical activity and obesity. And here we specifically controlled for, you know, we're comparing people who didn't live through a disaster. So people who did live through a disaster reported that they had, or in our analyses, we found they had less, uh, less physical, a decrease in physical activity and an increase in weight gain. So still thinking here about the individual, um, we uh, did um, a poll of around, um, in May of 2019, of around 2,500 older adults and asked them questions about emergency planning or their levels of, of emergency preparedness. Um, and what we found from that poll, um, and this was conducted, con conducted, conducted in conjunction with AARP, um, and we found that older adults are doing pretty well in terms of having a seven-day supply of medications. Um, about half had enough food and water to last a week. Less than half had signed up to receive local emergency alerts, um, and only about 40% had communicated um, with family or friend about family or friends about their evacuation plan. 
And not on this slide, but probably most concerning was that individuals who were on, um, who use energy dependent medical devices like oxygen concentrators or things like that was a very small portion of our sample, um, but only about 25% of those individuals had uh, reported having a backup um, power source. Um, so some of our um, takeaways from these two studies is, or these two and other studies that I haven't talked about is that we know that older adults may underprepare in general and um, may not always be the strongest at their own risk assessment because some of our findings also showed that although they were underprepared um, in terms of actual actions, their uh, opinions and attitudes were that they were prepared. So there was kind of a disconnect there. Um, our policy recommendation is around um, response agencies need to be prepared um, to address the consequences of this, and then also think about ways to better support older adults before disasters. For me as a scientist, I think about ways we can better support preparedness. Like how can we scientifically understand why people are prepared or not prepared and some of the decision-making about that. We have probably 50 years of research that shows that people in general don't prepare well. Um, and we have that same amount of research that shows just because you tell someone to be prepared or take these preparedness actions doesn't mean they're gonna do it. So how can we do a better job at kind of bridging that gap between, um, um, you know, instead of just saying, well, we told you to be prepared and you weren't, um, how can we support communities, individuals, um, uh, to take um, more definitive action. So in terms of the interpersonal level, I wanted to share two, two um, some raw data from qualitative interviews we did with um, home health nurses uh, after um, some recent hurricanes. And I'm going to read this because that's what qualitative researchers do. So this was a nurse that said, um, the pharmacy was not able to drive down um, uh, because of the flooding. It was too dangerous and there were too many roads that were closed. The pharmacy was dealing with flooding. Um, so I actually went and spoke to the director of the pharmacy to try and arrange this and said, is there any way you can, do you have TPN? And if you know what TPN is, it's a life-sustaining medication um, or a life-sustaining um, way of providing nutrition to individuals, not a medication. Um, can you mix what these needs, what, what he needs? Um, and the nurse said, we were able to get the order for his TPN and they apparently had enough of whatever they needed for at least a few days. So I, uh, we were able to bridge that. It was just two or three days until the water went down enough so that the pharmacy could deliver his usual supply, but then he's living on TPN. Um, so this is, an example of a, a home health nurse that went above and beyond on this interpersonal level um, to try to use some informal channels to um, to support her patient in, in receiving these, you know, life life sustaining medications um, um, due to in the in the presence of catastrophic flooding. A different nurse um, told me a story saying I was considerably more concerned about my patients than I was my family. I knew my family was basically okay, but my patients were not. My son lost everything in Hurricane Harvey, but I knew that physically he was okay and we would be able to help him and he was gonna be okay. So for that reason, I didn't worry as much about my family, but my patients, I can't fix those kinds of problems for them. And maybe when I grow up, I'll get to the point where I don't feel like I should. But I carried a lot of their stress my most memorable patient was when I had to actually try and find uh, her. And when I did find her, I explained that I'd been to their residence and she just started bawling and said the river took it. And it was terrible. It was truly, truly terrible because I was helpless to get her back home or any of those kinds of things. So I think that that stress level was tremendously high. So some takeaways here is that um, Traumatic stress affects individuals and communities um, and communities, community recovery from the shock of a disaster takes years and we need to, we need to better account for this. Some of the, the most urgent scientific need that for 
that I've identified as understanding how traumatic stress from the disruption of a disaster shows up in chronic disease outcomes and, and how we can better address this. And I think that gets a little bit back to um, Larry's question um, about some of those long-term effects. And gosh, I wish, I, I'm a crier. I cry like super easily. So being, trying to be a professional and sit through these or, or be in these interviews um, and not like cry as these, um, as these nurses were telling me these stories. It was uh, my uh, person I did these interviews with. We just left the interviews and went and we're like, we needed to just stare at a wall for an hour to try to try to recover from what we had heard. Um, I'm gonna look at questions. Um, I would love to put um, my um, uh, publications in the chat. Um, I, I don't know how to do that while I'm talking, but I'll get to that. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about um, uh, community impacts. Um, I've talked about um, the power shutoff alerts um, or not alerts, but uh, public safety power shutoffs, which you likely are familiar with, but it occurs um, as a preventative measure to um, in the event of um, severe threat of wildfires. Um, so there's some certain conditions that power will be shut off. Um, and, um, you know, there's been some well-documented effects of these or lack of planning of these, but I wonder if anyone's an emergency um, works in the emergency department and tell me how you think about the the um, city of Berkeley's planning. Um, the planning is if your power goes out, um, go to the ER. It, I, my background is an ER nurse practitioner. And when I saw this, I was like, I bet the emergency departments are losing their minds that that's, that that's the, the planning. So, um, you know, this was something I saw um, on Twitter uh, a couple years ago. Uh, took a screenshot of it and I took a screenshot and a um, couple hours later, um, this is a uh, um, another uh, news headline I saw right around the same time within you know a day or something. So this is the the effect of of lack of uh, planning for um, especially for individuals who are en en energy dependent who require on require electricity to um, um, you know, sustain their life in ways that, you know, many of us may not identify with. Um, but I wanted, we're talking about community here. So I wanted to think about, about community resilience, um, which the formal definition is on the right and on the left is um, the RAND Corporation has done a lot of work into resilient communities. Um, and so people define resilience differently. Um, the National Institute of Standards and Technology is the accepted definition, but someone like me thinks about it very differently than NIST does in terms of like building codes and standards. Um, but um, for I learned so much from this book. Um, it's by an academic from I think North. Eastern, Daniel Aldrich, who wrote a book about resilience and in terms of social capital. So when I think about our communities, um, I think about this def this way of thinking about resilience. Um, how connected are we? How much trust do we have in each other? And how often do we work together? Um, how well do you know your neighbors? If we're thinking about older adults who are socially isolated, um, you know, do you, do you have that kind of relationship where, you know, something's coming or something's happened that you can knock on the door and say, just thinking of you, I'm here for you. Um, I think that those kinds of social ties are, especially in our, you know, era of mis and disinformation, those social ties and networks can really uh, do more to bridge boundaries, um, maybe outside of a disaster as well. So, um, Community resilience is one of the most promising and difficult to define and measure aspects of disaster recovery. Um, um, investment in resilience is for the long haul. I need to put a period there. Communities need years of support to be able to see impact. Um, but in terms of science, if we're going to advocate that community resilience is this promising um, aspect of disaster management, then we need to understand how we can measure it. And we just don't have that now. Um, okay, so 
last couple slides is thinking um, about, I think this slide is slightly out of order, but this is um, thinking about policy um, and some of those, some just recent headlines from thinking about, about um, disasters and multiple sequential disasters, such as in, in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Um, getting back to earlier questions, this is a research study that I did um, that showed um, uh, hospital admissions after uh, among older adults increased 30 days after large scale disasters. We looked at eight different um, hurricanes. Um, we used Medicare claims data. Um, we took three days out of our, the first three days out of our initial sample um, or our exposure period to where we hypothesized that um, injuries or illness might account for hospital admissions during that time. Um, so when we looked at the remaining 27 days, we found um, varying by, by hurricane, but hospital admission rates increased up to 23% um, for general admissions, 37% in terms of the ICU, ICU admissions. Um, another study um, that our team did was um, that we looked at um, um, looked 10 years out at survival from um, um, certain types of cancer. And we looked at a Katrina, uh, Hurricane Katrina specifically, um, and compared certain types of disasters among a, a hurricane exposed group with people with the same type of characteristics um, in terms of, of socio-demographics um, who weren't exposed to a disaster or to Hurricane Katrina and found that um, there was an increase in certain types, increase in long-term mortality of certain types of cancer than among the, the group that did not experience a disaster. And our, our takeaway there is that, and I think this group gets it, it's not about the cancer um, itself, it's about the disruption in access to healthcare. Um, that, um, that is what we really need to be thinking about. Um, so I'm still on policy here. So, you know, a, a huge challenge of my work is that, um, is that I'm at the mercy of um, funders um, to, to do the work and to implement the programs. Um, and um, we continually see this reactive approach, like you see this huge spike during Ebola, um, whereas, you know, there's an Ebola epidemic raging in sub-Saharan Africa right now that's, you know, kind of mildly in the, um, in the news, um, but the public, the public and the policymaker um, makers have moved on. Um, we also saw a, a big shift, and this is a 20, ends in 2020, so it's probably much higher COVID funding. But overall, we see um, a decrease in funding for some critical programs that can support healthcare institutions to be prepared. Um, and that's, um, you know, um, something that's been going on in as we have have this uh, higher and greater awareness of, of climate impacts, um, we still see this decrease. But then we have the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which, um, you know, is um, maybe one of the greatest, um, uh, you know, potential for um, investments into clean energy and climate. But a critical issue there, and this is my kind of my key takeaway is that disasters start and end locally. They're affecting communities locally. So if we want to, to have these ambitious programs, um, um, we have to have the state and local action in order to implement them. And by that, I mean, um, you know, if, you know, if we win the lottery tomorrow, um, maybe the prudent thing to do is to have someone help us to understand how to use that amount of money. And we don't always, in many places, emergency managers, people working in hazard mitigation, people, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a chief sustainability officer in your, in your town, you're, you're maybe different. But a lot of places that need this money so desperately to um, implement these programs do not have you know the technical uh, technical expertise and the capacity to do the work to apply for the grants and put the budgets together to actually do the work so you know in terms of policy action i don't have a scientific uh 
urgent need here because I really wanted to hammer this home. If you know you're thinking about your communities across Michigan, um, that's really where we need to work on supporting those those local um, those locals who are going to do the mitigation and preparedness work in the communities. Almost my last slide. Um, I uh, this is a picture of a house after um, in Mexico Beach after um, Hurricane Michael, Mexico Beach, Florida. If you see the houses all around are gone, but this, this house is still standing. And when this homeowner was interviewed, he said, um, they said, how did you, what did you do? Um, and he said, when it came to building codes, I went 20% above, you know, I, I, I ordered 20% above, um, you know, the stronger bolts, the, you know, wind hurricane resistant windows, the concrete pilings. And this is the result. My house is still there. The other houses are gone. So, I try to use this as an example of what if we went 20% above and beyond for our older adults, um, um, you know, in terms of not just funding and dollars, but how we're, we're thinking about providing health care and um, health promotion, risk reduction, what, what might we see? That's it for me. Um, you see this QR reader? I really care about evaluation and feedback. It matters for me like professionally, but also I wanna be a better speaker. If I think this might be a little bit geared towards students, but um, I'd appreciate any feedback. And um, thank you for having me. And thank you, Lisa, for inviting me and sticking with me for um, 10 years. We have one minute for questions. Just the 